Okay, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the Gospel of Mark. And we are looking at this morning, Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. And today we will be focusing in on verse 27 through verse 33. Let's pray. Lord, this morning as we meet together, as we gather around the bread of life, Lord, please feed our souls with truth so that we would be nourished, so that we would be warned, so that we would be discerning to know the difference between what it means to believe and what unbelief is. Help us to know those things, even in our own heart, even in our own life, that we'd be able to examine ourselves on a regular basis. So we're always hedging against this very debilitating sin. And I pray, Lord, from Scripture this morning, we may glean the truths that are found there for our own edification and for the health of our own soul. And I pray this in your name. Amen. So this morning, as we're looking at this passage, before I get there, let me just give you where I came from and where I'm going. The last time in the Gospel of Mark, we were introduced to two warnings. The first warning is the great danger of unfruitfulness, and the second warning was the great danger of religious formality. And of course, if we're going to evaluate our present spiritual condition and the spiritual condition of really those around us even, then we need to, from time to time, give serious considerations to those two particular warnings. That spiritual barrenness can be noticed when there is no longer faithful adherence to Scripture, when there is no increase in faith uh, in the God who can do the impossible, when there is no heartfelt worship, when there's no spreading of the gospel to the nations, and of course, no sincere prayer or fruit of forgiveness. So to avoid withered roots and unfruitfulness and to prevent the trappings of formal religion and spiritual fruitlessness, the Lord gives a challenge to his disciples. And the Lord's challenge from last time was threefold. In verse number 22 of Mark chapter 11 was telling his disciples, listen, be uh, in the faith or have faith in God. It says verse 22, and Jesus answered saying to them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Of course, here it's talking about real faith in God that is absent of doubt and absent of fear. Real faith knows the disciple's source of all power, which is God himself. So a disciple's inner attitude on a regular basis is to trust God who does the impossible, who does things that no one else can do, and we're to live there. Secondly, he says to them, as far as a challenge, is listen, make sure that prayer is a priority in your life. It says in verse 24, Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Of course, he's speaking in these passages in a hyperbolic way, but he's saying to his disciples, listen, disciples' action of faith is prayer. The way we really demonstrate faith in God is how much we pray, how much we are seeking God in our private prayers, our public prayers, our, uh, all the prayers that we offer to the Lord on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, that we're driven 
to bring our life before God, to roll our life before God and make sure that we're praying. But we're praying in a specific way. We're praying according to God's will. We're praying in harmony with God's purposes. We're not just praying uh, anything. We're praying specifically and as we grow in the word of God. And then the the last challenge he gives them is to make sure that forgiveness is is an attitude in your heart. In verse 25 and 26, it says, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. So in other words, the disciples' attitude in prayer, which shows his faith and in the service to others, is to have a forgiving attitude. It's very hard to pray if you don't forgive people. It's very hard to pray and to trust God for the impossible if you're locked into some kind of animosity or hatred in your heart towards someone. It really can't happen. You shut it right down. And not only that, if your heart is filled with doubt, well, then you're not even coming to God believing he can do what we do ask him to do. So forgiving power cannot flow into our lives if we refuse to forgive others. It just can't happen. So we ought to forgive, and the reason why we ought to forgive is because God has forgiven you. That's the main motivation for forgiving. And so that brings us to where we are at today. Remember that the Gospel of Mark from chapter 11 to chapter uh, 16 will be the very... uh, Last seven days of Jesus' life, we already looked at day one, which was Sunday. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a colt late Sunday afternoon. Uh, It's set in the springtime, probably March or April. And then Monday comes. And, of course, when when he does ride into uh, Jerusalem on a colt, he rides as the king of Israel. And then second day, Monday... Jesus curses the fig tree and clears the temple because of its corruptions and abuses, and that's where he gives those two warnings, the warning against unfruitfulness and the warning against religious formality. And then day three is today. Today is Tuesday in our Passion Week, and the day after Jesus cleansed the temple, things are moving very quickly and it's, of course, it's leading to an intended climax. And so that's where we find ourselves today in verse number 27. Jesus is back in Jerusalem. He came again to the temple to teach and to walk around in the temple. And notice what it says in verse 27, at least the first part. It says, he, they came, that's him and his disciples came to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple... So that's what Jesus does. He always goes to the place that he already called his father's house. He cleared it out of all the garbage that got in there, and now he is ministering within that place. So Israel's religious leadership had all night stewed over what Jesus had been doing the last several days. They were not pleased with his actions in the temple. They were cringing at his teaching. And so Jesus exposes in the interchange with this very powerful, high-ruling, political, and religious body. What he does is he, he reveals the inevitable results of persons who remain in unbelief. But as they remain in unbelief, they're very religious. They're very active in their beliefs, but they are actually not believing the right things. They are concluding in the wrong ways. So there are people who are religious. They are active in their religion. They are active in their service, but they remain in unbelief. So I want you to take notice this morning in our text with three characteristics of unbelief. Because this unbelief can show up in your life. You don't want it to remain there. 
you want to get rid of it as quickly as you can. And so from our text this morning, as we go through it, the first characteristic of unbelief, that means a person who remains in unbelief, here's the first characteristic, they will not submit to Jesus' authority. They will not do it. All right, and if you notice, uh, it tells us right there in verse number 27 in Mark chapter 11, it says, they came again to Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you the authority to do these things? Now, so we see that this high-ranking religious group comes to Jesus, and they come with a certain intention. And their intention, of course, was not one of submission. It is actually was one of dismissing him. The only group that could have adequately resisted Jesus is the Sanhedrin. And that's what we have right here. This is the Supreme Court of the Jews. This is the highest ruling body in the nation of Israel. And, of course, who shows up at the temple? The chief, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. They make up the Sanhedrin, which would be the 70 that were the ruling body, the actually very powerful rule, ruling body in Israel. Now, if you received an inquiry from the Supreme Court of our land, that would be a pretty important inquiry uh, one that would, of course, probably make you very frightened, and it could, of course, quickly intimidate you also. Why are they contacting me? What do they want from me? So see, this high ruling body came to Jesus to intimidate him, to impose their power on him, and to frighten him. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to challenge him. So the level of intensity over the past several days have, has risen to a fever pitch in the temple area. And, of course, the potential for conflict was inevitable. Now, the Sanhedrin's intention was really already found in verse number 18. Look up at verse number 18 of chapter 11, what it says. It says, the chief priests... And the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him. So you know, they're in their motive already was a desire to destroy Jesus. How can we dismantle him? How can we expose him before the crowd? They wanted to do that. That's why they met with him the way they did. And so the Sanhedrin's intention was to destroy Jesus now, we can assume very quickly that they did not come for information. They did not come to be taught by Jesus in order to humbly receive truth. No, they were coming to entrap him, to gain something they could use against him, some incriminating evidence. They wanted before the people to dismiss Jesus as a religious wacko and a trouble, troublemaker of Israel. That's what they wanted to do. So what was their goal? Their goal in verse number 28 was not to bring themselves under the authority of Jesus, but to discredit him. That was their goal, and that was their plan. So their plan was to come to him in the temple before the people to challenge him with a question. The Sanhedrin came to Jesus personally with a very, very well thought out question. All right, and here it is in verse 28. Uh, it's packaged, this question is packaged as one question with two parts. Now notice what it says again in verse 28. It says, and he began saying to him, and of course they began saying to him, by what authority... Are you doing these things? That's the first part. Or who gave you this authority to do these things? That was their question. 
Now, you, you think right off after reading that, well, it doesn't seem like a very difficult question. They really want to try to find out at least some information about Jesus. But remember, they're coming to Jesus also because Jesus had no credentials. He had no degrees from any kind of Jewish un university. He was not recognized by the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel, as being a reputable teacher. Matter of fact, they wanted to get rid of him, and that was their motive. Now, what kind of authority do you do these things? Part of the question is really where, where you get your power from. And he says to do these things. Now, you say, what things? Well... He, he, the royal entry into Jerusalem, he presents himself as a king. The cleansing of the temple, he presents himself as a judge. The, his authoritative teaching that's been going on since the beginning, he's presenting himself as a chief rabbi with no education, no degrees. His miracles are performed as a divinity, and his authority, maybe the, the most controversial one is authority to forgive sin as God himself. So his charges against him are quite significant as far as this body is concerned. What Jesus does, he does with a bold otherworldly authority. He teaches with authority. He casts out demons with authority. He heals with authority. He commands nature with authority where who can make the raging wind and the heaving sea obey a word? Who could do that? See, by any consensus, no one can control the wind and the sea. Only God can. And, of course, the most controversial, he forgave sin with divine authority. Now, back in chapter 1 of Mark, where it all started off, in verse number uh, 22, we see this, and you don't have to turn there, but it says there, they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority. And then it says, not as the scribes and the religious teachers. He was a dynamic teacher. He was a teacher that spoke with authority. His knowledge was from God himself. Jesus was, was far removed from contemporary rabbinical qualifications, having studied no influential or famous rabbis. And Jesus needs no authority beyond himself. In fact, he cites no authority when he teaches, and he quotes no experts. Today, if you did that in a paper, you would flunk. Matter of fact, the reason why people get PhDs and doctorates is because they have to get to that level to be able to have anything to say that people would listen to. Before that, it doesn't mean anything, right? Because you don't have any authorities behind you. You don't have enough education behind you. You don't have anything behind you to back up what you say as being true or verifiable. And his teaching there, it says in verse uh, 22 of chapter 1, was amazing. Actually, it's the, uh, a word that means to be, struck by a, to be struck by a blow. That when Jesus taught, he taught with power, he taught with depth, and he taught with authority from outside this world. People would listen to him and say this, where did he come from? Because I never heard anything like this. And then when he started doing miracles, the people said, I never saw anything like this. So then Jesus displayed personal authority par excellence over life's highest authorities in the temporal realm and over the authorities in, in the spiritual realm too. So see, the second part of this question was in verse number 28, in other words, who, who's the author of this authority? Who gives you the right to do what you do? That's what they're asking him. In verse 28, see, so the author of Hebrews actually highlights the authority of Christ. Jesus is first and foremost the one who is sent. For it tells us in Scripture, I speak nothing 
of my own authority. I speak only with the authority of the one who sent me. So Jesus is speaking with the authority that comes from his Father who is in heaven. In other words, in other words God, God the Father sent Jesus to provide for man's salvation. And if Jesus, the prophet, brings a message from God the Father and that message is rejected, well, then there is no other message. So this ruling body of Israel just did not recognize that God was at work in Jesus in a new way, and God's sovereign reign was being displayed in the life of those who responded to Jesus' message in repentance and faith. See, they assumed that they had figured out Jesus at this point. They figured out that if we ask him this question, we really got him. We really have him cornered. But see, the problem was that they assumed wrongly about Jesus because their information came from the flesh, the world, and the demonic realm. They got Jesus wrong. And just get this. If you get Jesus wrong, you get it all wrong. All right? If you ignore Jesus, you are damned. If you do not believe in Jesus, the only other place a person can end up is an eternal punishment in the lake of fire. See, now why is that? Why did they act this way? Well, the greatest wickedness that exists among mankind was right there in their heart. And what is that? The sin of unbelief. The sin of unbelief. If you remember back in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, what did Jesus, what did the people say about, what did Jesus say about the people? He said this about them. He wondered at their unbelief. He wondered at their unbelief. That the level of their unbelief was at a fever pitch. Now let me mention that three years prior to this time, this group, this ruling body, had inferred that Jesus had done these things in the power of Belzebub, right? The power of demons. So in other words, what is worth noting here is that they have not moved in their position being in unbelief for three years. So they saw everything. They had all the revelation given to them that came through Jesus to them, and they did not move in their unbelief. In other words, they haven't moved at all. Now, in my reading, I came across this interesting thought in regard to unbelief. And the thought is this, unbelief is non-progressive. It's, it, 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 it is, this is very sad commentary and repeated so often today that people hear the message of how God provides deliverance and they miss it and set it aside as if it does not apply to them, that it applies to someone else and not them. Like when people say, well, I have my own religion. You give them the gospel, I have my own religion. Oh, you do. All right? Well, you know, what they're saying is that I'm in stark unbelief according to Scripture. I don't believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I have my own beliefs. See, your own beliefs is unbelief. That's the bottom line. So the people hear the message, and they do not apply the message to themselves. says, as long as they remain in unbelief, they remain stuck in the mud. They can't go anywhere spiritually at all. They can get no other information if they remain in unbelief. So by their question, the ruling body wanted more proof, not so that they can believe but so that they could deny Jesus the validity of any proof and to deny him his authority. That's what they wanted to do. So, in other words, here's the first point, is that, listen, a person who remains in unbelief will not submit to Jesus' authority, and it will be very evident in how they speak and how they live their life. They will just not submit to him. That's very clear. A second characteristic of unbelief, if 
found in verse number 29 through 32 is this. A person who remains in unbelief is just not honest with the facts. Atheists are not honest with the facts. Agnostics are not honest with the facts being presented to them because they just want more and more evidence or facts. They have more and more questions, but they never really, really want the questions answered. They just want the dialogue to continue forever. So here, a person who remains in unbelief is just not honest with the facts. Now, what do I mean by that from our text? Well, one question, Jesus says, okay, if I'm going to answer you guys your question, I have a question. Just one. Just one question. My question has one part. In verse number 29, it says this in 30. Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question and you answer me. That's an imperative. Answer me. That's a command. It says, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 30, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Simple question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? So Jesus' question is not evading their question. Actually, his question is a question of substitution. He's removing the focus off of him and putting it on another person, and that person is John the Baptist. Now, you have to say, so in other words... He is substituting John the baptizer for himself. And Jesus is asking something that is really well known to the whole crowd. Jesus is asking, was the origin of John's baptism from heaven or from earth? Was it merely human or was it from God? So the question is really ingenious because the Lord puts them in a catch-22 situation. Now, by way of definition, a catch-22 is a dilemma or difficult circumstances from which there is no escape. It actually comes out of the uh, film called Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. 1970s, where the main character fiends madness in order to avoid dangerous combat missions, but his desire to avoid the missions take and prove that he's insane. So either way, he's in a catch-22 situation. Now, what's the catch-22 situation? Well, because the authority and because of the authority and origin of John, the baptizer, in other words, the authority and the origin of John the Baptist and Jesus are one and the same. They originate from the same place. In Jesus' baptism, he was anointed for his earthly ministry, receiving the outpouring of the Spirit a seal of of approval that came from heaven and directly from God the Father. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. What? Listen to him. Right? That's what he says there. So the authority came right from the Father. All right, but that's not how the ruling body is seeing it. See, it's also a question to substantiate the longevity of, and the consistency of their unbelief. They want to corner Jesus, but Jesus corners them. See, they quickly and privately talk it over when Jesus posed that question to them, and they are talking like this. If we say that John's baptism was from heaven, then we must conclude John's authority came from Heaven came from God, was divine. 
Look at it says in verse number 31, they began reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? See, what, is he, what he's actually doing is he, he is substantiate, substantiating their unbelief. He's putting it right in their face. And then, of course, if they say from man, then they must conclude that John's authority amounted really to nothing. It was not divine or at all, but it was human. And that's what it says in Mark 11.32. But shall we say from men? Of course, they tested both sides of the coin and concluded this. You know, when you flip a coin, heads I win, tails you lose. Well, they flipped the coin, heads I lose, tails I lose. So how do you answer a question like that? Well, look at how they answer in verse number 33. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. Liar, liar, pants on fire. (laughs) See, they're not entirely telling the truth here. The facts all point to Jesus being the Messiah spoken by the Old Testament prophets. They had concluded who Jesus was, and they were not willing to know anything more about him. That Jesus and John's baptism was from heaven. All right? So they were not honest about their own spiritual condition. They didn't see their own unbelief. Neither were they honest about the facts surrounding John the baptizer and Jesus Christ. They did not commit themselves to Jesus. In fact, their unbelief was calculated. They knew exactly what they were doing. Of course, when you refuse Jesus, he refuses you. Look what it says in verse 33. Hence, Jesus refused to commit himself to them. It says, answering Jesus... They said, we do not know, and Jesus says to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So not only was their unbelief exposed, but they got no answers. They got no more things to find on Jesus to incriminate him, and so they're just left there. But that brings us to a third characteristic of unbelief, and it's this, that a person who remains in unbelief exists in the realm of uncertainty and fear, especially fear of people. All right? Now, look what it says in verse number 32. But shall we say from men? And then it says, they were afraid of the people. For everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. That's interesting how that scripture is laid out there. Uh. They were afraid of the people. See, their fear was well-founded, especially if Jesus was allowed to continue. If he continues, then they will lose all their power and authority. They didn't want that. Their fear should have been for God. Instead, it was misplaced fear of man. Implications may mean that this high-ruling body of Israel did not regard John the baptizer as a real prophet, even though everybody else did. So everything they're doing is backfiring on them. The opposite of a real prophet is what? A fake prophet. In other words, a false prophet. And, And, of course, what is the penalty of a false prophet if you're caught? Death. That's exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to present Jesus as a wacko false prophet. But let me just step back for a minute because this is, this is very interesting. The crowd, though, believed that John the Baptist was a real prophet. What is the problem with this ruling body? Now, don't forget, John's mission was to be a forerunner for Jesus Christ, for the Messiah. And the term forerunner may be used when considering John's message that he spoke something 
previously spoken beforehand. When John the Baptist came on the scene, he didn't have a new message. His message was what where Malachi left off, the, old, the last Old Testament prophet. 400 years went by, and now here John shows up, right? And what does he show up? The same exact message that Malachi preached. He starts preaching the same thing. Repent from your unbelief because the kingdom of God is at hand. So John was called by God to lay out the groundwork. See, John the Baptist appeared, the Bible says, in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke because Luke make this, makes this a little more clear. Luke chapter 7, verse number 30. See, the question would be, did Israel submit to John's baptism? See, that would be the question. But before we look at the passage, I want to say something. The most radical thing John the baptizer did in the wilderness was this. He called Israel into the wilderness to be baptized. That was a slap in the face already. Why? Because in the Old Testament times, there was a proselyte baptism for the Gentiles. If you wanted to be converted to Judaism, if you wanted to worship the true and living God, you had to be baptized. They did this because they considered the Gentiles as unclean and unfit for the presence of God. There was no baptism for the Jews. There was no baptism for the sons of Abraham. So in other words, John's baptism was a clearing ritual in order to become members in the covenant community of Israel. But Israel was thinking, we're already in the covenant and in the nation. So see, John comes, who instead of calling the Gentiles to be baptized, he does the most radical thing you can do, and it's an unheard of thing you do. He calls the Jews to participate in the proselyte ritual of cleansing because his baptism was a repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This was something that Israel just would not have. We are already in the kingdom. We don't have to enter the kingdom by any kind of baptism and repentance. We don't have to be prepared for anything. Well, look at Luke chapter 7, verse 30. Notice what it says. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by who? John. They outright refused to be baptized. So if it comes down from the top, what do you think the rest of the nation had done, right? But remember, when John came, people were getting baptized. Even leaders were getting baptized, Jewish leaders. And that was the point. So John comes and he, he, his message is repent to have your sins forgiven. For behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. So the baptism was a baptism characterized by repentance. However, his baptism was not intended to induce repentance, but rather to administer to those who were repentant. In other words, they were coming, realizing as Israel, they have sinned against God. They were a nation in hypocrisy. They were a nation that had, they were going through all the motions, but their heart was far from God. That's what they were repenting of. So that meant that repentance alone fitted this person or that person for baptism. In fact, the Gospel of Mark an analogy is given by John the baptizer concerning the critical nature of the, this urgent moment in time. And this is what it says in, in Matthew. It says, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Now, who, who, who is the tree? The tree is Israel, right? And where are, they, where are they corrupt? They're corrupt in the roots, right? If you're corrupt in the roots, 
It can't produce fruit. Matter of fact, the tree is going to ultimately die. This is a judgment against Israel. Therefore, every tree, John says, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the tree cutter has observed that the tree is fruitless and needs to be eliminated. The tree is Israel, and they need to be cleansed and cut down. And John uses another analogy to stress the need of the moment where he says, and his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and will gather in his wheat into the barns, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So the crisis moment of separation between the wheat and the chaff is about to break through. And what was he talking about there? He was talking about Messiah appearing on the human scene, and when he comes, Israel wasn't ready. That's the whole point of John's message. You're not ready. I've come to make you ready. That's what I've come to do. That's my job given by God from heaven. I've come. You, Israel, are as unclean as the Gentiles. I know you don't want to hear that, but that is God's evaluation of where you're at spiritually. And Israel, you need to be cleansed and prepared for the coming Messiah, right? So when we come to Christ, what do we need in Christ? We need to be cleansed, right? We come, we come repenting of our sin that made us dirty and unclean to come into God's presence, and we come and believe in Jesus who becomes our sacrifice. And what does his blood do? Washes away our sin. So what? We become clean so we can enter into God's presence. That's what he does for us. His, of course, cleansing is an eternal cleansing. John's cleansing is that of water baptism in which he prepares a nation to receive the Messiah. Because what does it say about John? John makes ready the way of the Lord and makes his path straight. So the picture is that this, for the winding roads to be made straight and rough, the obstacle-ridden roads of all the garbage that has accumulated because of all the wrong teaching is leveled and made straight for the coach of the Lord to arrive. So spiritually, John called for moral and spiritual repentance in the hearts and lives of the people of Israel. The very heart of John the Baptist's message was to prepare Israel for the Messiah. And that's what he does. Jesus did, I mean, John did not fail in his mission. All right? So Jesus' baptism, in his baptism, Jesus was anointed for his earthly ministry, receiving the outpouring of the Spirit again and and a seal of approval that came from heaven directly from God the Father. And, of course, it is clear then that the origin of John's and Jesus' ministry from beginning to the end was from heaven and divinely ordained. That's where they should have, con- that, that's what they should have concluded as, as a ruling body and then teach, teach the whole nation that truth, but they didn't. They didn't. They had it all wrong. They had Jesus all wrong. They couldn't even see their own unbelief. They were blind. They were dead to anything spiritual. So if a person continues in unbelief, there will be an end result. You know what the end result is of unbelief? You want to get rid of God. Why do we have so much unbelief in our country? is because we have been getting rid of God at all levels, right? We have been throwing him out of everything. We've thrown him out of the classroom. We've thrown him out of the government. We've thrown him out of the church, all right? And so unbelief is prevalent in our society in a huge way. And the the deceiving part is this. They don't know. They don't believe. They are in unbelief, but they don't see it. So in other words, the end result, unbelief leads to its own solution. Let's get rid of God, and if we can kill him, let's kill him. Now, that's all very logical, isn't it? Because their motive has already been to destroy Jesus. 
And then notice in Mark chapter 12, verse 12, what it says. Now, Jesus gave a parable. I'll look at that next time. But in verse 12 of chapter 12, he says, and they were seeking to seize him. And yet they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke a parable against them. And so they left him and went away. In other words, that, listen, the, they wanted to seize him right there and then and drag him out. But remember, it's only Tuesday. That will happen at the end of the week. They will finally kill him. And by killing him, they would think, they will think they have won and that they have accomplished their mission. But again, that backfires. Because they haven't been reading the scripture. Their, their religious books have been, they've built so many fences around protecting the truth that they never can even get to the truth anymore. You realize that? And so they are in a place that unbelief will bring everyone. Let's get rid of God. As long as God's not there, I don't, I don't have a guilty conscience. As long as God's not there, I can live the way I want. I can do anything I want. I make the rules. As long as God is out of the picture, I'm pretty much free. I can go and come and do what I want. Right? And, and see, that's how people are living today. That's why the marriage institution is under attack. I, can, I don't have to get married. I can live with the person. All right? I, I don't have to... You know, I don't have to keep my baby. I can just abort it because the government says I could do it. See, and all that leads to, uh, it all, this all comes out of unbelief. So, you know, that means there's several things from Scripture we can glean from unbelief. And if you take your Bibles for a minute, look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 12. Just a few observations. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 12. It says this. And let me just say this before reading the passage. The sin of unbelief makes your heart or a person's heart evil. Look what it says. Hebrews 12, uh, excuse me, 3, 12. Chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brethren that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. See, this passage is telling us to watch out for each other so that there will exist no unbelief amongst us. It would be truly sad for someone to have such a heart or continue continue in unbelief. See, the trouble with unbelief is that it, it, all, it is always in the heart. It's in the mind, the seat of the will, the emotions. Unbelief is a special kind of evil because unbelief tends to make the heart even more evil. As long as God is not present in a person's life, they will become more wicked, more evil, more sinful. That's what will happen to them. So an evil heart has a tendency, notice what it says in the passage, to bring a person to fall away from the living God. So the more a person is in unbelief, the further they will get away from truth until they don't even know what it is. They, they couldn't even recognize it if they heard it. And they go, it's a downward spiral. But the, the thing about unbelief, too, is that it is an eternal sin. It is the unpardonable sin. It's the sin that sends people to hell. If you don't believe in Jesus, there's no way to be rescued. You realize that, right? The second observation is found in Matthew. No need to turn there, but it says in Matthew 13, 35, the sin of unbelief also restricts or shuts out truth and mercy and God's grace. It shuts it out. This is what it says in Matthew 13, 58. And he did not do many miracles because of their unbelief. So God stops working when unbelief is prevalent. Especially, I'm talking about 
resistant. I'm not talking about unbelief that exists before you hear the gospel. I'm talking about unbelief where you hear things and you get settled in your own way of thinking and say, I have my own way of thinking. I have my own philosophy of life. I don't need those things. And in fact, I think religions, all religions are just a crutch. You have to lean upon them. Somehow you have, you're not a strong person if you need this religion to lean upon. But you know what? Christianity is not a religion. It's about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. He's the central person from Old Testament to the New Testament. He's always been the central person. But one of the most damning things about unbelief is unbelief ultimately proves that a person has no love for God at all. And why is that? Because they're afraid of everything. They're afraid of people more than they're afraid of God. They're afraid of what people are going to think about them or how they're going to conclude about them more than they are concerned about how God looks at their lives. So a person who is settling in on unbelief is a very fearful, fear-ridden person. And there's plenty of things in the world to be afraid about. But what is interesting is in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 18, 18, this is what the Word of God says. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. So what is so revealing about unbelief is that it shows that a person does not love God because when a person is in in the love of God, a person is sanctified and they're sanctified by the truth, fear eventually dissipates. Parental peace comes over us. I'm in God's family. The heavenly father is my father. If he cares for the sparrows, and feeds them every day, he's going to care more for me than them. See, that's in my thoughts because the Scripture changes my mind about what happened to me in Christ Jesus. So, see, in other words, that I am at peace with the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, and I have love for God. When I don't, I have no love for God because I have no salvation, and then ultimately I have no peace And the person who is in unbelief is a restless person, a fearful person, a tormented person, and a person who has deep distress in their soul. But where the love of God is because of salvation flows a stream of rest and satisfaction of soul and delight and boldness before God. See, God's love in the human heart removes By God's perfect love in in that heart of his children, it removes all sins and all fear. If God removed my sins and his wrath and condemnation, what do I have to be afraid about? I have nothing to be afraid about. See, we don't have to be afraid because our sins were judged in Christ when he died on the cross. The Father cannot judge our sins against again, without judging his son again. And, of course, we know Jesus can't go to the cross again. We don't need to be afraid because the Bible says he first loved us. From the very first, our relationship to God has been one of love. And we don't have to fear because the Bible says right here in 1 John, perfect love casts out fear. It can't even coexist. It casts it out. It removes it. So as we grow in love, our love for God, we cease to be fearful of what he will do. In other words, I know God will not judge me and send me to hell because of Christ. I know that my sins have been washed away, never again to come up against me in any kind of divine court of law. So God, what he does, he wants his children to live in an atmosphere of love and confidence without fear and torment. 
So growing in God's love will give us boldness in the day of judgment because we understand what great love has accomplished in our behalf and it will give us boldness in the face of also every day. So, so as we mature in God's love, gradually the fear vanishes and our hearts are fully controlled by his love and we learn to rest in God, God's love all of our days. And of course, this means too we are hedging against the sin of unbelief. We're keeping it at bay. So a person who remains in unbelief will not submit to the authority of Jesus nor listen to his messengers. A person who remains in unbelief will not be honest with the facts. They will twist and distort them so that they feel comfortable in what they believe. And then a person who remains in unbelief will not be free from fear because of their rejection and dishonesty. Fear controls them because they eliminate God from what they think and what they do. In other words, don't get caught in this sin. This sin has eternal consequences. And you know what? The Bible says that the Spirit of God moves and works. We don't know where the, the Spirit blows or where the Spirit, the wind blows this way or that way. That's the way the Spirit is. Sometimes the Spirit will come in and convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment of Jesus Christ and gives you the opportunity or a person the opportunity to believe. And what they do is they blow it off. And maybe the Spirit never blows back that way again. And they never hear the gospel again. And so they become more and more settled in their unbelief. They think they have plenty of time, right? They think that, hey, I'm going to live forever. I take my vitamins. I got my green drink, <laughs> right? Take my probiotics. I am set, man. I have just increased my life 10 years. Isn't that what they sell today? Now, of course, there's some truth in health, right? But... Healthy people die all the time. See, be ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist had, the had, to, had to make the nation ready. The Spirit of God makes us ready to receive Christ. He's the necessary condition for us to believe. And when we do, then we're going to be growing in our knowledge and wisdom of Christ to the point where we understand he loved us first. We didn't love him before, but now we're loving him. And because we're loving him, he's casting out all the fears that we have, right? And we're hedging against the sin of unbelief, and we're starting to recognize it in the world and in our family and in those around us. So, see, this is a message that kind of preventive medicine. Let's be very, very aware of what's happening, especially in our own heart. Where do we stand before God? Do you know for sure if you died today where you would go? Are you certain of that? The only answer is Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, the life. No one can go to the Father who's in heaven except they come through Christ the Son. So let's just take these words and think about them and meditate upon them and examine ourselves by them and then continue to grow in Christ so we're not caught in this downward spiral of unbelief. Let's pray. Lord, thank you this morning again for the word of God. It is awesome. It is uh, the word that comes from heaven, and when it does, Lord, it so exposes our heart. It so changes our mind. It so causes us to see things in a way that we have never understood them before. And Lord, for this, we have to be overwhelmingly thankful to you. This morning, Lord, we want to submit our lives to you. We don't want to be like a person in unbelief who doesn't submit. We also, Lord, want to be honest with the facts, not only the facts about what you've done in salvation, believing that the only way you can be saved is through, 
repentance and faith in Christ Jesus, but also, Lord, the facts about us. Where do we, how we, have we grown spiritually? Are we bearing fruit? Or are we just heartless and just going through the motions? Lord, when we're at that point, please convict us of those things so we quickly get back into a prayerful relationship with you and a relationship where our minds being washed and transformed by the word of God so we know what the prescriptive will of God is every day of our life. I pray for that. And I pray also, Lord, that when it comes to the end that we would not be fearful about judgment because you have taken that fear and we understood you demonstrated your love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, you died for us. So Lord, love casts out fear. Your love does. And I pray, Lord, as we live our life, that we become less and less fearful about things, especially the most important fears, as where will we go if we pass from this world? And I pray, Lord, that we would also live in a way where we realize life is short, and we don't have much time. So I pray, Lord, we would live it to the fullest for you. And that we would give all our heart, mind, and soul to serving you and serving your church and preaching the gospel to people and living a holy life that pleases you. And I pray, Lord, as we do that, that you would be, your name would be glorified and lifted up in this world. In the midst of all the unbelief, Christ would be shining in the middle. And that some who have not yet heard would come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And that they too can come into your family and into your church. I pray that for us today. And I ask it in Christ's name. Amen.